Hello everyone and welcome to the 2018 Small Farms Winter Webinar Series hosted by U of I Extension Local Foods and Small Farms team. Uh, my name is Graham McCarty. I'm one of the Local Foods and Small Farms system educators in the Rockford area in Northern Illinois. Um, we appreciate you joining us for these webinars. We try to do our best to begin and end within the span of the hour. This is a pretty tight time frame for educators and just kind of know that we're trying to deliver in-depth actionable information why we may be limiting you um, kind of based on kind of the questions but please use the text box to enter the, the questions at the side and I'll do my best to make sure our presenters answer them as time allows the presentation will be recorded Zach will email a link to the archive presentation as soon as possible after this concludes um, there will also be a link to a very short evaluation tool and we'll very much appreciate your feedback on this so this week's presentation is from Chris Enroth. He's one of my fellow extension educators stationed in the counties of Henderson, Knox, McDonough, and Warren counties in Western Illinois. Chris is a horticulture educator who is responsible for horticulture programming with an emphasis towards the home gardener, landscape maintenance personnel, commercial landscapers. In addition, Chris coordinates master gardeners, provides their training, continuing education, advanced training, seasonal events, and community outreach. Chris received a Bachelor's of Science in Landscape Horticulture from Southern Illinois University and a Master's in Landscape Architecture from Kansas State. With that, I'll let Chris take it away. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Grant. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. I do have having a little bit of issues with my headset here, so if I do cut out in the midst of the program, someone just, just let me know or type something in the chat box and I will uh, try to remedy the mistake. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started on uh, this topic when it comes to growing these uh, unique crops. And I'm going to spend most of my time, I would say, discussing uh, ginger and uh, turmeric. You know, those are bolded here on the side. Um, it seems to be the ones that folks are most interested in. But I also want to talk a little bit about my experiences growing uh, sweet potatoes, which may or may not be a unique crop for you or your market, um, but it might be for some others. Uh, my experiences with hops and then recently growing parsnips. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I want you to know, though, is where am I growing? Um, so uh, the image here, the, the top uh, picture here, this is my high tunnel. It's, it's just a small 12 by 24 foot high tunnel. Um, it's at the McDonough County Extension Office in Macomb, Illinois. Um, and it's part of this larger uh, food donation garden. We call it the gift garden or growing Illinois food together. And here are master gardeners. We grow, uh, I would call it uh, marketable um, food for donation to our local food pantries. And um, so just want to make sure that you know kind of where I'm coming from. I don't work uh, exclusively with commercial growers or uh, market gardeners, but um, you know our, our goal is kind of the, that market level produce that we want to give out to our, our local food pantry. So just kind of a little bit of background of, of where this food is being grown at. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the one everybody, I think most everybody wants to hear about is ginger. Um, it, the nice thing about ginger, and, and also uh, got a lot of information uh, on ginger from uh, Vermont State or Vermont, uh, Virginia State uh, University. Um, they're doing some research on ginger down there and also Cornell. And we're going to see aspects of both of those research projects within this presentation. So when you're growing a, a new or a unique crop, you really have to analyze the cost uh, with the, the benefits. And if you think about um, many of the, the crops that we're going to be talking about today, I'd say almost all of them, um, with the exception of like hops, you know, this is something where you really need to be growing or utilizing some type of a season extension device. And in my case, it was, it was a high tunnel. Um, so within high tunnels, what do we usually plant? Well, we're often planting tomatoes during the summer, and then we're planting something like leafy greens in the cooler seasons. And why do we plant these things? Well, because they give us the highest amount of returns for um, the cost of the work that we put into growing them. And so they're a very popular uh, crop. But the thing is, 
Um, there's also a lot of uh, universities and uh, state extension groups uh, across the country, and they're studying these less common crops because we want to help growers um, improve their market potential. Um, and, and also, another big one, because we keep rotating these same crops in the high tunnel over and over again, we really want to help to break that potential disease cycle. And so, yes, this these unique crops can be part of your crop rotation plan. Um, so, you know, having like a constant crop of the same vegetable year after year, uh, it's going to lead to decreased soil health. It's also could potentially lead to uh, increase in disease. And a lot of like the literature that I've been reading and, you know, and tomato production and high tunnels, they're talking, they cite brown leaf mold quite a bit uh, of tomatoes. And so, this mean here, um, this just has kind of the, the, the top tomato diseases on it. There's a lot more problems that you can get uh, when, it come, when you don't practice crop rotation. Um, so again, we want to have these unique crops to uh, improve crop rotation practices so we can avoid any type of soil or disease issues uh, while still adding to that uh, market potential for the growers. And so, it, Kind of with ginger and why I'm, I'm singling this one out mostly is that ginger, um, in terms of the Cornell studies, is showing to be fairly competitive when it comes to the returns uh, when you compare that with tomatoes. And so um, we're going to be looking at ginger first, but you know we want to talk about the market. And here I do use ginger as an example, but you can kind of apply this same the same principles to some of the other crops out there. And so you know so by using ginger as an example. Um, it, if you would be selling your product or ginger to a grocery store, or maybe you, you have some type of a specialty market in your area, it's going to be really hard to compete with the uh, imported ginger price. Uh, typically, uh, imported ginger is going to be less than seven dollars per pound. You know, anywhere from four to five dollars on on average. Uh, could even be lower than that, kind of depending on um, the supply and demand of your area. However, to, in order to get that good rate of return, we really do need to be selling our locally grown ginger for anywhere from twelve to twenty dollars per pound. You know, who who's going to buy that um, when you know you have the you're, you're faced uh, on the grocery store shelf? You have that you know four ninety nine per pound ginger versus that twenty dollars per pound uh, ginger. Obviously, most people are going to be opting for the cheaper cheaper one. So that's when. Um, there are some options, other options like selling to specialty food groups. I heard, have heard of uh, instances where ginger uh, growers, uh, they are selling their entire crops to say like a microbrewery uh, that will make some type of ginger ale or some type of tasty drink out of it. Or also there's health food businesses uh, that will use that ginger either in processing and some type of other um, a product, uh, or maybe they will sell it, uh, the root hole. Um, and then just basically on, on reading, I've seen wholesale pricing of ginger anywhere from 10 to $15 per pound. And not everybody has uh, a microbrew that might be interested in, in making ginger ale with your product, or maybe there's not a health food business that's sourcing locally grown items. And so for most of us, I would say our best option is going to be the local farmer's market. So when it comes to our uh, farmer's markets out there, um, Again, this is probably going to be your best bet for selling uh, unique crops like ginger, because here you're going to get um, you're going to get a higher price per unit um, when, when you compare it to the actual like volume of, of stock that you might have. And the uh, the New York or Cornell study uh, shows that growers for market or also those that include ginger and CSAs, they're selling that product for about four to six times the conventional uh, ginger sold in places like grocery stores. And so that's that's pretty nice because um, you know you do have a lot of potential to move a small volume of product, this in this case ginger, with a very high margin of sale because you can you can go upwards of twenty dollars per pound with this stuff. The other thing is the novelty of the crop. Um, and um, you can dig up some some ginger and you can do some type of interesting presentations at the stand uh, where where you're selling this product. It could be the plant. It could just be uh, the roots themselves, or maybe it could be some 
some product or that, that somebody could make it into, like a ginger ale, a homemade ginger ale or something like that. And the other interesting thing about ginger, and I think this is where it kind of um, divides itself, uh, separates itself from a product like turmeric, is ginger has been part of our American culture um, since Europeans started coming in here and settling because ginger, even though it's an Asian um, crop originated out of Asia, the Europeans have been using ginger in their cuisine for hundreds of years. You think of things like uh, ginger ale again, ginger snaps, uh, ginger cook, gingerbread cookies, things like that. And so this is not like a hard sell for folks. Uh, most consumers are familiar with, with ginger, um, and a lot of them also know the medicinal benefits that come along with uh, this type of product, um, most namely things like reducing nausea, uh, very popular for, say, um, expecting mothers that might have uh, morning sickness, um, or if you uh, get, you know, get uh, motion sickness when you're traveling on a car or a plane or something like this. Uh, so ginger does have medicinal benefits that are well known, and so and and folks have been using ginger as part of our cuisine for a long, long time. And so a lot of folks are familiar with this product already. The other thing is um, you can actually freeze the the type of ginger that you're going to be selling. And so you can, if you do any type of a winter market or winter CSA, you can incorporate some of this kind of um, uh, more tropical, uh, Asian-inspired uh, uh, taste into uh, a winter market. So that, that's another really good thing. And, and additionally, um, you can also harvest the leaves of ginger, uh, dry those, and you can sell those uh, for making things like uh, tea. And so... Um, there's, there's a lot more to, to ginger than just meets the eye, and so we're going to be talking about that. And, and here's just some numbers um, uh, pulled from uh, Cornell's uh, research of this. Uh, and I um, first ran across this study uh, when Judson Reed uh, ran into him at the Illinois Specialty Crops Conference. He presented this information. I thought, oh, this is fascinating. So I talked to Judson afterwards. Uh, he shared this with me. And you can actually um, just Google uh, the title of this slide here and this research uh, presentation will be one of the the top results that you that you'll come across but basically in summary here um, what the Cornell research showed is that ginger they grew ginger in um, they partnered with a couple different farmers um, and they set their unit price at sixteen dollars and so kind of at that spectrum from twelve to twenty dollars it's kind of middle of the road there uh, and in that first year that they grew in 2014 their uh, dollars gross per square foot was five dollars and seventy nine cents. Now compare that to tomatoes, which is seven fifty, and so that that's that's pretty decent. And the other thing to keep in mind uh, that Judson remarked is that the next year, after they kind of had a year experience of growing that product, so next year in twenty fifteen, they grew single row ginger, which actually yielded seven dollars and sixty eight cents uh, per square foot. And then they also incorporated a double row of ginger, yield, yielding about $8.80 per square foot. So, you know, they got that year experience of growing that crop under their belt, and they were able to raise that profit margin quite a bit. Um, ginger was actually not um, first. Uh, so if you kind of aggregate these costs of the different types of ginger in that 2014 study, um, so what came in first, obviously, tomatoes, again, biggest moneymaker, especially for high tunnel growers. The second was actually um, a single liter cucumbers that came in about seven dollars and eight cents, uh, and then ginger followed that. And so even that first year of growing, ginger was still quite a competitor when it comes to um, that decision whether or not to to delegate space, that valuable valuable space in your high tunnel to a new and unique crop. And um, the other thing takeaway from that study is that about a pound of ginger seed, uh, and we'll talk about what seed we're talking about here in a second, but about a pound of that yielded about 10, over 10 pounds worth of uh, harvestable product or yield. So let's talk about growing ginger. Now, ginger is a tropical crop, um, and you know, the, the primary saleable portion are the rhizomes, the, the roots of the ginger. 
as I said, you can harvest leaves to make tea, things like that. Uh, but if you want to sell something like mature ginger root, that is what you find in the grocery store. You need about nine to 11 months worth of time to uh, grow that uh, rhizome and then allow it to cure and mature. Um, and it's something that you would find on the grocery store shelf. So what most folks here in the Midwestern US are going to be selling is not mature ginger. It's actually baby ginger or immature ginger. Um, and, and harvest for this actually happens periodically throughout the fall months. And so, you know, you can harvest plants as, as needed um, or harvest them all at once and freeze them. But either way, you know, what, whatever way you go about growing this, uh, ginger and also turmeric, season extension is a must. And so you really do need to use something like a high tunnel. I, I would love to have a greenhouse. So if anybody's got an extra greenhouse, just want to send my way, I'll take it. Um, but greenhouse, of course, would be a, an ideal setup, especially for those colder winter months. Uh, let's see, a question about the discoloration of the leaf tips of the photos. We're going to talk about that teacup farm. So that that's coming up. I learned a lot of lessons in growing these unique crops. And I'm this, this is not going to be necessarily a presentation of um, all things uh, good and, and right, and there's going to be some things that I will share with you that I've also learned. So the first thing to know is the type of seed that you're going to be using, kind of like how we call a, a potato uh, seed. It's actually the, 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 the root portion of the potato, a root piece. Same thing with ginger. It's just a portion of its root or rhizome. And um, purchasing these seed pieces uh, can be uh, quite an investment. Um, you know, you're looking at uh, anywhere from like $8 per pound. Um, also, I read in the Virginia Extension uh, publication, there's groups selling uh, $4 per ginger plant. Um, so that, that, that's quite a bit. Um, but the key thing here, when you are ordering ginger seed or maybe your uh, saving seed from a, a last year crop, um, make sure that you only use the mature ginger piece, so like the kind that you find um, at the grocery store, but um, we don't want to be using the stuff at the grocery store because those actually sprout poorly. Um, and and so, but but you want them to be mature, so they have that thick skin uh, on them. You want them to be clean and disease free. Um, all, you know, kind of like what the image here is um, on the right side of the screen. So this is ginger that I planted uh, from last year's crop. I, I am sprouting it this year. So you can see that it looks very healthy, uh, firm. Um, and then you're going to want to cut these into about uh, two ounces per seed piece. Uh, and when you do that cutting, you have to make sure you sterilize your knife between each cut. Um, we're going to talk about disease here in a bit. Disease can be a big problem with with ginger. Um, so sterilize that knife between each cut and each uh, piece needs to have at least two eyes or growing points and you can see on the image here uh, what those growing points or eyes look like. Like there's an obvious one right there but then right next to it we got another piece right there. Uh, kind of these little nodules that form off the, 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 the edges of the, that rhizome right there. So you need at least two of those per seed piece. And I would, of course, recommend getting the scale out, measuring things out the first couple cuts to make sure you're, you're getting that two ounces. And then experience will breed familiarity uh, from then on. You also, again, in the, in the hopes of controlling disease, sterilize those seed pieces in about a 10% bleach solution. Then you take those out, rinse them, and cure them out in the open for about three days before planting. Uh, and this is just uh, another image here. Uh, this is uh, another ginger seed piece. And you can see, if I back up the difference between the two, this is nice, healthy looking. Uh, from last year. This one's also from last year, but look at the dark portions here. Um, you know, it's, it looks obvious. There's obvious uh, indications of rot here. So that's something where um, you cut that portion off and you just toss it. Um, don't even try to resurrect that because just the threat of bringing in some type of uh, root rot into your ginger crop, uh, you don't want to risk that. So you cut that off or you would just dispose of that entire seed piece. So next comes pre-sprouting ginger. And pre-sprouting ginger occurs about mid-February to March. Kind of depends where you're at um, here in Illinois or in the Midwest. Um, 
and you're going to use a soilless potting mix, a sterile soilless potting mix. And what you're going to do, um, we're going to see images here in the next slide. Place, um, you're going to place uh, the pots, uh, you know, in the potting mix. You're going to place the seed pieces in that potting mix and cover lightly, about an inch of uh, potting soil on top. And then, you know, I took another tray um, and just placed it over top of that. Um, for some of you larger commercial growers, you might have, if, you, if you're really investing quite a bit of space um, into this crop, you might even want to modify like a walk-in cooler um, to keep, stay warm. And by warm, I mean about 80 degrees, you know, 70 to 80 degree range. Um, uh, and you got to keep that humidity up uh, really high as well. Um, and you're going to keep it in this uh, pre-sprouting chamber anywhere from four to six weeks. And so if you start to see um, the rhizomes begin to sprout and shoots are emerging, that's when you pull them out, put them in a sunny location, and obviously here a greenhouse is ideal. Um, high tunnels, you know, if we're talking, they're sprouting in March. Like right now, it's too cold for me to be putting this stuff out in the high tunnel. So mine are still indoors uh, under light. And by doing this, it gains you about a, a month on the growing season. And basically, you're just ensuring the ginger plants, um, that th they have enough vegetative growth, they're fully leafed out, to take advantage of the long days of June and July. So this is the basically the process here that I uh, went through. So uh, first step here on the left is you trim uh, the seed piece, and so this is that seed piece that has that uh, rot on it. So you take a sterile knife, you trim that top portion off. You might even go a little bit lower than that um, in case that rot's progressed farther into the root. And what I've done is I just took a flat, and I had some old bathroom tile from a project at home, and I laid that in the bottom, and I filled that with sand here um, on the slide two. And uh, this is basically to just help hold some of that thermal mass of the heating pad that I laid on top uh, next. And um, just trying to make sure that I'm, I'm keeping that, that, the, that soil volume warm to about 80 degrees. I uh, don't really want to go much higher than that. Um, and then within that flat on top of the heating mat, I laid another flat, uh, this one of the soil media with the ginger seed pieces within them. Um, Things do dry out, so I just went ahead, you, you spritz it with some type of water. Again, if I were in a greenhouse, I'd probably just do a quick uh, uh, flyby with the hose. And then um, I cover it with another flat, and just to make sure you know we have a good seal, I put another couple pieces of tile on top. Um, and, and kind of the, uh, an issue we have is more of a, a, a with the, our office kind of issue is uh, the joke goes that we have no insulation in our walls. Um, and so there's actually quite a drafty breeze, and so I found a use for all of the old uh, uniform shirts that are lying around the office to help insulate and hold that heat in a little bit more. Now there are some growers, and I, I, this is one thing I'd like to try this year, is to grow uh, my ginger in containers um, the entire season. Again, you're using a sterile soilless potting mix, uh, amended with the, you know, it's usually a peat-based mix for us here in the Midwest, um, and you're going to be mixing compost uh, and slow-release fertilizers. And there's a really good fertility schedule that Hawaii has produced for growing in pots. Um, there's a link probably in your handout if, uh, for those watching the recording, I'll make sure that that link is included in the notes below. Um, most growers, it recommends uh, planting in a 15-gallon pot. You can place up to three ginger seed pieces, uh, two to three inches apart from each other, and the inside wall of the container. If you're going smaller than 15-gallon containers, um, probably only going to be planting one, maybe two seed pieces in there. Now, this is a critical uh, temperature here. You want to make sure... Um, when you're growing uh, in, a, in a pot or container in a greenhouse or high tunnel, you have to maintain that uh, ambient air temperature above 55 degrees, even at nighttime. We cannot risk, uh, especially the soil in that container, dropping below 55 degrees, uh, because again, these are tropical plants. Less than 55 degrees, uh, you run the risk of uh, uh, killing the rhizome, and so you need to keep those temperatures elevated. And this is a container grown ginger late in the season. So the image on the left here, this is in Virginia. Um, it's been growing all season long in these pots. And this is October. This picture is taken in October. 
And in Hawaii, uh, as the picture on the right, they're using fabric pots, and these are about five to six months old, and because you can pretty much grow ginger in Hawaii all year long, you got the season for it. But for, I'd say most of us, and in, in the way I grew uh, ginger last year, it's going to be in ground, um, most likely underneath the plastic of a high tunnel. And so the first thing you do is you cut a trench, a four to six inches a deep trench. Um, and I, I kind of equate this, uh, you're digging a trench and you fill it in as the ginger grows. Um, I kind of equate this to starting a new patch of asparagus. Now you could do the opposite of that. Instead of cutting a trench, you would plant the seed pieces and then over time mound soil up against the plant, kind of like growing potatoes. Uh, and we're going to talk about um, why we are slowly mounding soil up on the, the stems of the plant here. Um, but it's mainly because ginger, the ginger rhizome grows up and out. The other thing is um, ginger roots develop best in soils with uh, a high phosphorus level. So adding some type of super phosphorus, rock phosphate, something like that in your amendments is really good. Also, at the bottom of that trench, organic matter is critical. These plants really do like a, a good, rich soil. So uh, in this picture, they're uh, amending it with a mushroom compost. You could do yard waste compost, compost to manures. And they're also mixing in slow-release fertilizers. We're going to talk about fertility here in a couple slides. But of of course, always, I want to make sure um, base your amendments on soil testing. Uh, so again, if we're planting in the high tunnel, or if you maybe you live somewhere in the southern U.S. and you're planting out in the field, um, again, that critical temperature, your soil should be actively warming and above 55 degrees. That's, that's kind of that temperature threshold you don't want to go underneath. Um, uh, Virginia? recommends planting uh, seed pieces about five inches uh, spacing on center and you can do either one of two things you can go a single row as you can see in the the image here uh, the single row or you can plant double rows or staggered rows um, row spacing give these plants plenty of room uh, they do grow uh, they, they, they will grow out they'll grow wide so about three foot on center um, and upon that initial planting cover with one to two inches of soil the other interesting um, tip, and this comes from uh, Virginia as well, is within that high tunnel, um, consider accelerating the season and, and providing extra protection by growing underneath uh, an additional low tunnel within the high tunnel, or maybe some type of row cover fabric, something like that. Um, they've just found that in the initial process, uh, things are working out you know, really, really well in terms of uh, that. So hopefully the sides are advancing right now. I've just changed to the hilling slide. Hopefully folks can see that. Um, so when it comes to hilling, we talked about how ginger grows up and out. And you want to be hilling your ginger because that will increase your yield. This is something that I didn't necessarily encounter. Um, or I didn't necessarily heed the advice of uh, the seed company that sent me my ginger pieces. Is more of just I forgot. Um, to do hilling. Uh, and so you can see in the image here from, from Virginia how they are, for each new plant, um, they're hilling about two to four inches of soil at the base of the plant. You're going to wait um, until you start seeing a bright pink at the base of the stem. Then you'll hill up those two to four inches of soil. And you're going to do this about every four to six weeks. And by the end of the season, you might have a foot tall of soil um, hilled up against that ginger plant. Ideally, the soil you use is going to be some type of a compost, finished compost. Um, could be soil amended with compost. I probably this year I'm just going to be um, taking the compost that we use and just hilling it up on there. If you're doing containers, I really like this idea. So again, back to Hawaii with their fabric pots. They simply just, they've, they've rolled down the sides of the fabric pots, and then every time they need to hill, they just roll up the sides of the fabric pots. Um, so fairly simple process, um, and that picture on the bottom right, right here, that's actually my ginger from last summer. Again, I didn't hill uh, during that year, and I certainly paid the price for that, uh, not getting much yield off of those ginger plants. But I've learned my lesson.
So when it comes to fertility of ginger, uh, another lesson I learned is that ginger is a heavy feeder, but it's not very good at seeking out and taking up nutrients. Uh, just because it doesn't have a very large surface area. You know, we see that big root and we think, oh, that's a big surface area. But not when you compare it to, like, root systems of other plants that have these small or very fine roots that can seek out nutrients and they have a lot of surface area for taking up nutrients. Ginger doesn't produce many small roots. Uh, so a lot of that fertilizer has to pretty much be placed right up, uh, up against the plant. And so every time you hill, that's a good time to incorporate some type of a complete fertilizer. Uh, organic fertilizers or slow release uh, synthetic fertilizers work best because these bind in the soil and they're available as ginger needs them. Kind of when I was growing my ginger, I prepped the beds as I usually do, uh, loaded up a lot of my nutrients up front, used compost, uh, poultry manure, some blood meal, and I planted the ginger. It did awesome, but it stopped growing. The leaves started to be discolored, and you, as, uh, as you saw, the leaf tips started to die back. And I'm like, well, what's going on? And so I did a side dressing of worm castings. I keep a worm bin for another class that I give to uh, students. And the ginger just took off again. And then it slowed down a few weeks later. That's when I learned this crop is definitely that heavy feeder and not very good at taking up nutrients. So fertility is very important with this one. Uh, watering the crop, obviously drip irrigation is recommended. Ginger doesn't like having wet feet, um, but it needs to have a consistent watering schedule. Um, and this note here, too much water um, can actually slow down growth at the beginning of planting. However, uh, also overwatering can leach out excess nutrients. And so if you are in an area that has a low humidity uh, type climate, not really a problem where I'm at in central Illinois near the Mississippi River, um, you can set up some type of a misting system to mist the ginger canopy regularly, kind of uh, emulate that, that tropical environment. You'll also need to increase uh, your irrigation. But if you ir increase irrigation, also keep in mind you have to increase your fertilizer applications to compensate for any nutrients leaching out of that soil. And this is the other thing that I learned about ginger is that, that yes, it likes those warm soils. It can't go below that 55 degree threshold, but it also can't go above 90 degrees. So if you think about in a tropical climate, uh, it might be warm there, but it, it, the soil temperatures are relatively stable. So uh, this is especially important for those growing in a high tunnel. Again, temperature management. You go over 90 degrees uh, soil temperature, your plants will fail to thrive. Another reason why I was getting those um, uh, brown, tattered uh, tips of the leaves there, I, I just wasn't managing the temperature correctly. So if you don't have one, invest in a soil thermometer, or you could go just use the meat thermometer out of the kitchen. They're pretty much the same thing. Um, and use, you can use shade cloth if you're growing outside. Um, you can go up to 60% uh, shade. Uh, you can use the, you know, the shade patterns of nearby trees. Um, in its natural environment, ginger actually prefers about a 30% shade. And so if you're uh, growing underneath high tunnel, uh, in a high tunnel system, uh, that plastic reduces the uh, intensity of the sunlight enough that that, that kind of equates out. Um, you can also use a denser spacing, uh, like we recommended five inch, maybe you go four inch, um, so that the ginger canopy closes over and shades the soil, keeps it cooler. And if you are in a pinch, turn on that irrigation system for a few minutes during the heat of the day. Um, if you have to do that routine, routinely, remember though, um, keep an eye on that fertility schedule. Um, question on the chat box as understory of rainforest is the drip water high in nutrients, so we should add worm tea to the irrigation. Um, I, that's not something that, that I did. Um, you can use some type of a, inject some type of fertilizer within uh, the, the water or within the, yeah, the irrigation water itself. Um, most what I've been reading is folks are just tossing in either that organic-based or that synthetic-based slow-release fertilizer um, at planting, and then when they hill up. Um, I, I don't, unfortunately, have much experience with fertilizer in injection um, or using worm tea within the irrigation water itself. Uh, 
Uh, when it comes to harvesting ginger, most growers, again, will be harvesting that uh, baby ginger. It's considered to have superior flavor, but it's got short shelf life. So you got to keep that in mind. But good. But you can freeze it um, and, and hold it for months. Um, I would say uh, harvest. Uh, you can harvest all at once. Again, freeze what you the excess, or you can harvest throughout the fall months and just have them available uh, in the this market and the next week's market and the week after that. Um, and you can harvest pretty much four to six weeks after you started, uh, not four to six weeks, four to six months after pre-sprouting began. So again, a very long season crop. Uh, you, ba you basically kind of like digging up a potato. Uh, you, uh, you, you, I used a potato fork, dug up the, the ginger plant shoots, rhizomes and all. The rhizome should be kind of a creamy white and the top have this pink uh, scales right, right there. Um, for market, a really good uh, technique and also good for preservation of the, the product and presentation is trim off uh, the, uh, the foliage but leave about one or two inches of green stalk. Um, this just looks really nice when you set it out um, in a basket maybe at a market or in a CSA uh, basket. And again, we mentioned if you did want to harvest mature ginger with that thickened skin, it's more fibrous like what we have at the grocery store, requires significantly more time and I would say a greenhouse. You know, you want to have, if you're growing in a high tunnel, you really got to have this ginger out of there by November. Again, keep an eye on that soil temperature. It goes under 55 degrees, you're in trouble. So this is something that I did this past year. I saved seed. Um, rhizomes have to, uh, basically, I just pop some of the plants out, threw them in these pots under lights inside, um, and then they probably stayed alive for about a month, and then they went dormant. Uh, you got to keep those soil temperatures up again. Uh, be mindful of any disease. If you do have any rhizomes showing disease symptoms, get it out of there. Um, remove it right away. You know, toss it in the next uh, stir fry you do or something. Um, the other thing is, uh, store bought ginger is not it is not for growing. It is made for for eating. So don't use store bought ginger. The, the the germination or the sprouting rates for store bought ginger is very 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 poor. Uh, just some pests of ginger. There's not many here in the continental U U.S. Uh, sometimes armyworm could be a problem. Leaf spot not really a big issue. The biggest one is bacterial wilt. This is, affects the root system, um, spreads by infected soils, tools, your hands, your boots, equipment, irrigation. A lot of things can spread this disease. Um, one way to tell if you do have uh, rhizome with, uh, infected with bacterial wilt is you can cut the surface of the rhizome and put it in water. And look very closely if you see a cloudy material leaking from um, that, that stem or that, that surface. That is the bacterial ooze and you know to remove those plants immediately. Again, this is another instance where crop rotation is, is very, very important. And the other thing to keep in mind is Hawaii used to be the biggest producer in the world for high quality uh, ginger, but because bacterial wilt became such an issue, they, they aren't even in the running anymore. India is the biggest producer right now. Okay. So that was, we spent most of our time talking about ginger. Um, we're going to cover a couple other unique crops out there. Um, another really interesting one, a one fun one that I really enjoyed growing last year was turmeric. Now, the thing is about turmeric, it's in the same family as ginger. And so all of the, a lot of the cultural items that we have already discussed pretty much apply to turmeric as well. Um, it's a tropical plant. You utilize the plant root, the rhizome. Um, and it's used as a flavoring in something like curry, use it in mustard. Uh, it's put in American cheese for coloring also, uh, and butter. And also the medicinal value. So if you are marketing the medicinal value of your crops, um, turmeric holds within it um, an incredible amount of antioxidant power. Um, research shows that it uh, sequesters free radicals. Uh, helps to fight infection, anti-inflammatory, improves digestion, dis uh, digestive disorders. 
Um, there's actually studies showing links to cancer-fighting properties, uh, improvement of symptoms suffering from Alzheimer's, and there is many, many others. And so if you're wondering, is, is turmeric a growing, you know, is growing in popularity, note that in, from 2007 to 2015, the import of turmeric annually has increased 223%. And so not as many people use turmeric, but it is definitely growing in popularity. We're using a lot more of it here in America. It has a little bit longer of a growing season than ginger, about a seven to 10 months. So same process though, you, you pre-sprout it. Turmeric takes much longer to pre-sprout though than, germ than ginger. So uh, while ginger might take anywhere from four to six weeks, turmeric can take up to three months. And when I ordered my turmeric um, seed pieces, I, I waited and waited. I checked to make sure there was no rot, it was still good. My patience was eventually rewarded, but it, it took a long time. Um, used a heat mat, uh, kept that soil temperature up, in that 70 to 80 degree range. Um, something I also didn't, I didn't mention with ginger, but we'll be holding like ginger and turmeric inside until we can plant it. You know, we have those soil temperatures above 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, don't forget to, don't, don't neglect your plants. Remember to do some type of a slow release fertilizer um, in around the pot or in the tray, wherever you're growing them. Um, and you, you can transplant uh, your ginger or turmeric when it comes to turmeric. When it has three to four leaves that have sprouted, you can put them into a bigger pot. You move them out of, say, this flat that you have here, um, and then you pot them up into a bigger pot. And then you just hold on to them and just keep that fertility, keep an eye on, keep an eye on it. Um, oh, you want me to say turmeric? Ah, uh, sorry, I don't pronounce it like that. Um, when it comes to transplanting, um, you can again plant in pots just like ginger or in beds prepared again with lots of organic matter and slow release fertilizer. But the thing with, with turmeric is you don't have to hill it like you do with ginger because the turmeric rhizomes develop below the seed piece, um, not above uh, as in ginger. So you also have to keep the soil temperatures warm above 55 degrees and these plants grow tall. The ones in, in my high tunnel is, is kind of fun uh, to like go into the high tunnel when these things were at their peak, you know, they can get up to six foot tall. You kind of feel like you're getting into the jungle here. Um, harvesting, you're not going to get as great of yields uh, when it comes to ginger. I mentioned before ginger, you're looking at like uh, for every pound of seed pieces you plant, you want about 10 pounds uh, per pound uh, of yield. Uh, turmeric, you're going to get probably, you know, five pounds of yield is pretty good. Um, you're going to be harvesting a little bit later than ginger, about a month. Uh, again, you, you, you can cut apart the rhizomes, wash, sell the largest, save the smallest for next year. Uh, again, leave about one to two inches of green stem attached for market presentation. Um, also, like ginger, you can utilize leaves of turmeric um, in, in cooking. Um, you know, you can you do some type of demonstration or presentation at your stand even. A very popular thing is actually uh, roasting or, or baking fish you know, wrapped up in turmeric leaves. And both ginger and turmeric, you just walk into a planting of them, you just kind of move your, your hands through the canopy there and just all of these very um, tropical, you know, uh, delicious scents uh, can come up and meet your nose. Uh, can leaf be ingested? I don't think so. I've just heard of folks uh, using them to cook with, you know, kind of equating it to like the bay leaf that we toss in our stews and stuff. You don't eat it, but it imparts that flavor into the cuisine. Um, this was the, the turmeric that I saved for next year. Um, I would equate uh, turmeric to kind of like... Um, like an amaryllis bulb in a way. Um, it actually will grow and grow and then uh, it will go through a period of dormancy about a month um, and then it will sprout again. And that's exactly what happened is uh, I, I really did nothing in terms of taking care of this plant other than putting it under the light here inside, making sure it, it didn't dry out too much. I've already got turmeric sprouting up um, from that pot. Uh, in my office, uh, just chomping at the bit to get it outside. Again, we still got some time to wait, though. So that's uh, ginger and uh, turmeric. Um, 
going to very quickly go through a couple other uh, crops out there. The first one is hops that I have started growing and some lessons I've learned on hops. These can all take their own presentation, so I'm going to go fairly quick through these. Here's just some lessons that I learned. So here on the left, you need good drainage. Um, it's a must. To my location where I have them, it's not the best option in terms of drainage. So knowing this, I went in, I amended the soil with good organic matter, I mounded the planting area. I probably should have mounded them a little bit higher. Things have settled over time. Have had issues with, with root rot. This is a fairly level, uh, I wouldn't say poorly drained, it's just a level surface that doesn't shed water very, very easily. The other thing is full sun. So obviously I have my hops planted along my high tunnel where we're at here at the extension office and um, the hops plant here on the middle picture towards the back um, in the afternoon that's shaded out by a sycamore that's just to the northwest of it. Uh, if we move further along you get more sunlight and it's obvious that the hop vines in the full sun yield far better than the ones that are receiving that afternoon shade. Um, you need a good trellis too. Um, for a long time I was just pretty much um, mounting them on top of the high tunnel. I did take some time to go out, find some uh, wood snags out there, got those in the ground, um, and so you, you really need to make sure that you're trellising these things to their proper height. Um, these probably still aren't high enough. Uh, I think these poles are about 18, 16 to 18 feet. 18 feet would probably be generous. Um, I would say 16 foot tall. Far, far better growing conditions though I've found uh, utilizing some type of proper trellising device. Also need to make sure that you have a good airflow. Um, one thing, one year I kind of had this idea, what if I train my hop vines into the high tunnel? Um, as you saw, I was right next to the plants and so, and I've always wanted to take advantage of this vertical space within my high tunnel. Um, and and so I I don't know quite what, what I was thinking. I thought maybe I'll be on to something. Turns out they don't do well inside a high tunnel. So don't, don't try this. Um, they need good airflow. They need exposure to rain and to other beneficial uh, predatory insects because what happened in, within the high tunnel is spider mites just devoured these plants. There was pretty much nothing I could do to stop them. Um, so make sure you got good airflow. The other thing is nutrient management. So nitrogen is critical for hops. They're a fast growing plant, but don't forget about the other nutrients. Since hops, um, I focus most of my effort on the nitrogen, but I, I neglected to address the other micronutrients. And so last year I saw discolored leaves. As you can see in this image right here, I was befuddled. I was like, oh, I've been taking care of my nitrogen. So I submitted a foliar tissue sample and discovered the plants were deficient in boron. So following that, a boron application, they grew out of it. And so keep an eye on all of the nutrients, the whole spectrum. And then a pest, common pest that I have encountered is the eastern comb butterfly. And that's what's pictured here. These caterpillars can ravage my hop vines. They just, within a couple days, they can go from the bottom to the top, top to the bottom, totally strip them off. And so I just uh, apply a BT product. To, to keep them under control. They're actually very easy to control. You just have to scout, keep your eye out for them. When it comes to harvesting hops, it does depend on variety. Check out um, Vermont Extension, Michigan, Colorado, Washington. These all have good resources on harvesting. Um, when you go to harvest, you do have to calculate moisture content. Um, of your cones and so uh, Vermont Extension has a really good spreadsheet that walks you through that and proper drying having making sure you have the proper uh, drying rack built and set up. I actually made a couple videos on these topics last year you can check them out on my YouTube channel it's uh, University of Illinois Extension Horticulture um, and they're called the Greenspeak series so check those out. These are other uh, resources for hops We'll throw these in the description also if you're listening to the recorded version. And also, best resource here in the state of Illinois, Grant McCarty, um, a moderator for today's session. Um, you know, if you do have commercial hops questions, get in touch with Grant. He's a great resource. Next, we have sweet potatoes. Again, is this a unique crop for your market? Maybe, may not be. 
Um, this was kind of another experiment in the high tunnel. Again, I'm tired of tomatoes. I want to try something different. So I grew some Beauregard sweet potatoes in ground and also suspended in fabric and plastic, plastic pots overhead. So starting them, um, you can order your slips online or you can start uh, your slips. Here I just have uh, uh, the sweet potato uh, seed pieces here suspended in cups of water. This is from a WIU student project I did last year. Um, the other thing about sweet potatoes is it takes time for those, when, once you plant them, those slips, it takes time for the sweet potatoes to take off in the spring. So I interplanted um, lettuce and some sweet peppers. I was able to harvest the lettuce as the sweet potato vines took off and created this carpet. Uh, and the peppers then were well established by then. They grew over top of that, that, can, that canopy of sweet potato vines. Um, just make sure here you have some extra drip emitters, some extra fertilizer uh, for those peppers. Um, when it comes to soil prep, I actually experimented with three different types of uh, bed prep methods. So the one that's pictured here is actually the, the cover crop bed. So we sowed a winter cover crop here. The other bed was amended with peat and perlite. And then finally, the third bed was amended with compost. And when it comes to yields, the cover crop bed outperformed all of the others uh, by, by quite a bit quite a bit. So that's the cover crop there. It, it died, created this nice mulch, worked out really well for the sweet potatoes. Some other issues, voles were a huge problem. Um, uh, all beds experienced some type of vole damage to the sweet potato tubers. Some uh, There were some plants that were untouched, um, but vole control, that, that was an issue. I did get a snake that moved into my high tunnel that summer, uh, so that was nice. Um, when you dig the sweet potatoes, obviously you gotta be careful. I damaged it right there. Um, so digging them out, you actually, the, I have a video I'm producing on, on when I harvested these sweet potatoes, but uh, basically you, you'll prune off the, uh, the foliar growth, leave the stems sticking out of the ground like little flags of where to uh, find the, the underground tubers. Um, one thing to, to keep in mind is the, the hanging baskets uh, that I utilized, they were a great addition. The size of the roots weren't that fantastic though. Um, they were small sweet potatoes. I called them fingerling sweet potatoes. So if that market exists for you, give it a try. And the other nice thing, there was no vole damage in those hanging baskets. Uh, don't forget to cure your sweet potatoes. I don't have a picture of that. Instead, here's just a picture of the sweet potatoes that I chopped up and uh, deep fried because the, they were delicious and so they're really, um, something that my family utilized, uh, we just cured them and they stayed in our basement all winter long. We used them as we needed them and then uh, the remainder were used for making slips for the next year. Those are the uh, hanging baskets right there. The plastic one, um, would not recommend small plastic pots like that. Highly recommend as big a pot as you can suspend uh, in your high tunnel. The fabric was nice. Uh, we had drip uh, irrigation running directly uh, into the pot. Um, so these plastic pots, I think they just got too hot. They didn't breathe enough. Um, these fabric pots, they did much better. Some more resources on sweet potatoes. Iowa State University has some great videos on that. And then parsnips. Um, parsnips is the last crop that we're, we'll, be, we'll be covering here. Uh, I grew these this past year. Um, it's another long season crop. I grew them, as you can see, in the high tunnel. Um, and the parsnips are, a long, again, long season crop. About 110 days is what the seed packet said. Uh, so actually we had uh, WIU students, horticulture students, plant them uh, early April, uh, back in 2017. We did it in the high tunnel. Um, so make sure your seeding's good uh, and uh, they can be slow to germinate. Uh, it requires constant irrigation. Um, it, it, they, it, can I, I think they can take actually about three weeks to germinate, so it takes time. So be consistent in the watering. So after planting, we put out uh, two lines of drip tape and we put them on an automatic timer. The other nice thing is being in the high tunnel, it helped to take some of the guesswork out of setting the timer because there's no rainfall going on in there. So we just very consistent watering schedule. Once they uh, started growing, weeds were not an issue. As you can see here, they, they really took off in growth uh, early on in the summer, and they created this, this wonderful canopy um, that suppressed the weeds. And so of all the weeding that I did do last year, this little bed of parsnips 
didn't have to do any type of weeding. So it's so a really, really nice. Um, I do have a video out there on harvesting parsnips. Um, so check that out. Again, it's at uh, 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 University of Illinois Extension Horticulture, the Greenspeak series. Uh, when it comes to harvesting, though, cold weather does bring on a sweeter flavor. Um, so harvest pars harvesting your parsnips, do that uh, after they've experienced their first hard frost. Uh, you can dig them up all at once, um, uh, or you leave them in the ground for the duration of the winter. Protect them, as we did here in the high tunnel, and you can just leave them there, kind of like just holding carrots over winter. Um, they're in the same family as carrots. One thing, though, protect your skin because these are related to the wild parsnip. And and so you, you just want to make sure that there are some folks out there that are sensitive to the sap of even the uh, cultivated parsnip. Wear gloves, wear long sleeves when you are handling uh, this plant. So just some final thoughts for you here. Um, I, I want to make sure that you, you don't, turn your back on the money makers. In fact, um, as I've been seeing, a lot of growers are starting to limit their crops that they grow uh, to only those that, that make them money. Uh, kind of seemed like before you talk to a fruit and vegetable farmer, they grow everything under the sun. Now they're kind of like pedaling back on, on those different crops. You know, They're not taking just any random person's request now at the market, um, and they're shedding off those that don't perform above kind of a set level of income for them. So, so make sure that you, you hold on to those money makers, those crops that you're familiar with. Uh, when, when trialing new crops, start small. It doesn't hurt to experiment with new stuff uh, to try to gain more market potential for your farm. Uh, and also this new crop might help break some type of disease cycle if you incorporate it into your rotation. And with these unique crops, it kind of does become more than selling. It also is an educational uh, component to it because these new crops, um, you're going to have to tell these customers how they should be using them. You can have demos um, or work with restaurants uh, or the farmer's market committees. Maybe you can have a chef come out uh, to the market to cook something up. Our local Macomb market just did that last year. We had a local chef come out. Um, they brought out some produce from the different farms, and the chef cooked it all up. It was a really good event. Um, presentation does help this also. Instead of just plopping the harvested crop out there, bring out like bring out the, uh, an entire plant of turmeric. Maybe you leave one in a pot or container instead of planting it in ground. That way customers can see what it looks like when it's growing. And it also helps to start a conversation. You see that tropical plant over there that might lead to a sale. Um, don't, don't, don't think that, that you're going to have all successes either because obviously as farmers you know some of these are going to be duds. Um, you, you're running a business, uh, you're, 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 you're making risky decisions and that can lead to either success or failure. Uh, I like to think of kale as the easiest plant to grow. But does everybody want to be eating kale? No. I, first time I grew kale for my for my family, I grew 25 kale plants. You know, thinking that would be that would be enough. Um, I was then forbidden after that to, by my wife to ever grow kale again. Um, this was just coming out of our ears. So watch the trends and don't be afraid to take a chance. Um, and also season extension. It, it's pretty much necessary for the growing of ginger uh, and also turmeric. Um, you know, so these do well in permanent fixed high tunnels, though. I, I really think for some of these crops, like looking at like sweet potatoes, maybe parsnips, having some type of a movable or temporary caterpillar tunnel, man, that would be nice. Because when I, these long season crops, when I have them in the tunnel and I want to be planting things, cool season things in the fall and early spring, like lettuces and other uh, leafy greens, I, I can't because they're full of sweet potatoes uh, and parsnips. And so, um, season extension helps uh, for most of these. It is a must. Um, and maybe even look at um, temporary season extension devices like caterpillar tunnels uh, or, or, or low tunnels would be a, another good option. So in, in light of that, um, we got us uh, about a minute before 1 o'clock. Um, I will stick around for questions, please. Uh, I've, there's been activity in the chat box. I haven't been keeping much of an eye on it, though. 
All right. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, we have been looking at some of the questions, some of which you have already answered. Um, there was a question about, uh, do you have any experience with cover crops for sweet potatoes? Uh, crops for sweet potatoes? Uh, Nathan not... had already shared it on cereal rye, but didn't know if you had any other suggestions. Or cereal rye plus a legume. Uh, yeah, so the, the, I guess all I can really share is the cover crop I used for uh, the sweet potato one of the sweet potato beds, uh, it was essentially just a winter cover crop. Um, we planted it in the fall and got great germination in the high tunnel. And I, my plan was just to open the sides up of the high tunnel uh, in February and just let everything freeze out. That happened to be one of the warmest winters that we've had on record the last couple of years. And uh, even though I opened up the sides of the high tunnel, uh, it got pretty cold in there. It didn't get cold enough to actually winter kill those crops. And so I wound up having to cultivate some of them by hand. Um, but it was just uh, your run-of-the-mill um, winter cover crop mix. Uh, I know there were legumes in there. There was some uh, rye also in there. Um, uh, essentially, it was just a cover crop mix I got uh, from an online seed dealer. All right. Uh, someone else had asked about saffron. Have you looked into growing saffron? Um, I see that Vermont has a resource on saffron, which I put in the chat box for folks, but didn't know if you had any insights. I, I mean, I've never grown that, so I, I, can't, I can't give you any insight other than, you know, that's another good idea. <laughs> Just a, <laughs> a, new, uh, a, a new thing to, to test out. Um, definitely worth a try. I know it's, very, it's, it's a very pricey crop to get into, but... Um, yeah, I would check out Vermont's resources there. I, I, sorry, I don't have anything to contribute to that. Um, any insight into how to improve germination of parsnips? Um, I, I think soil prep is, is fairly critical. Um, we, we got, we got, oh, I'm sorry, can you still hear me? Yeah, we can still hear you, Chris. Okay. Um, we got really, I think we got really good germination. Um, so soil prep, we uh, top dressed our bed with compost and we planted into that compost. And then again, we had, um, we just had a very routine regimented uh, irrigation schedule with the drip tape on a timer. Um, I, I think we did, we did really well. Um, in terms of germination. Now I said it can take up to three weeks to germinate. Um, pretty sure trying to remember here um, I would say it took less than that for us I can't remember the exact timing but it, um, it, it, it I was very pleased with the germination success of our parsnips um, in my area things like carrots are really tough to grow um, so one of the things we do is uh, plant into compost uh, just keep an eye on that initial watering schedule when you before you get germination all right um... I want to ask, is there any kind of guides out there, resources that compile where you might purchase the cutting, say, for the ginger and the, the turmeric? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I sourced um, our ginger and turmeric uh, seed pieces from, um, from a, a company uh, up in Wisconsin. Um, there used to be a, a fairly popular ginger seed source, I think in like West Virginia or somewhere. They've since gone out of business. Uh, you can order things from Hawaii. Um, I don't have really good recommendations. Uh, I, I would look into some of those specialty uh, seed suppliers. Uh, I guess just like three examples to rattle off. Uh, don't promote any one company or anything like that over another. Uh, I know Baker Creek Heirloom, uh, Young Seeds, um, there's a supplier in Hawaii for ginger seed, but I, I bet you could find more in your local area. The other thing with turmeric is it uh, turmeric germinates very well from the grocery store shelf. Um, it just takes a long time, so, but you do get fairly good success uh, utilizing turmeric bought from the grocery store. But if you are a commercial grower, you're not going to you're going to be paying a definitely a higher cost for something out of the grocery store as opposed from a, a seed supplier. I've also heard that you have to order your seeds, uh, like your, the rhizomes, early because they often sell out. 
So if you try to, you know, get your rhizome seeds for ginger too late, you can have difficulty finding a quality, reliable source. That, yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Zach. And, and so in, in that vein, try to order them in the fall of the previous uh, of, the, of the previous year there, because most companies are not going to be shipping this stuff in the winter. Uh, they just don't want to risk their product getting frozen out on the mail truck. Okay. Um, Teacup Farm has been talking with Nathan in the chat box about on cover crops. Um, have you seen anything where something like an army worm or any insects might be moving to rhizomes in your uh, with your ginger and turmeric? I haven't seen anything. I, I do think the, the bed that had the cover crop, um, it had really good cover for the voles. And I, it probably is a good as, assumption why you know a lot of vole damage did occur there. Um, but as I said, ac actually in terms of natural predators, I uh, had a snake that moved into that bed as well. And the vole, da I mean, the vole damage pretty much um, stopped midway through the growing season. But it had done it already done its its job there uh, in producing what would be an unmarketable product. Um, and so. It, I, I haven't seen anything insect-wise. Um, I have heard of cover crops, though, promoting um, not necessarily pest insects, but beneficial insects, predatory and pollinator insects. Okay. Uh, Andy asks, do you recommend interplanting radishes to mark rows of parsnips? Um, yeah, I think if you can get that crop out um, before those parsnips uh, develop that canopy cover, um, yeah, definitely. And radishes, uh, it's like a 30-day or you know a little bit, a little bit longer uh, crop. Um, then yeah, I think it would work out. So we have a participant has has a store-bought turmeric that has sprouted, has about one half inch of green foliage and roots. She's wondering when can she plant it into the soil. It's in the water right now. Um, if it is uh, sprouted, has green foliage, go ahead and uh, plant it into some t uh, a soilless potting mix. Uh, make sure it's a. Uh, if you're going to be raising this indoors, um, it needs to be in a spot with a, a lot of light right now, um, and you'll be able to move that outside then once temperatures are reliably. I would say a. I would say ambient daytime temperatures above, uh, definitely above 65 degrees during the day. Again, uh, you have to make sure you, you, you if you're going to get nighttime temperatures at 55 degrees or lower, you have to bring that pot in um, uh, to protect it. And so just that that is critical, um, that 55 degree threshold um, and, and keeping your plants from, from experiencing the too cold. All right, and then uh, if they purchase turmeric from the retail store, should it be organic or does it matter? Um, I I'm not sure. I guess if it depends if you if you're a certified organic grower, then um, it, it probably would not be permitted to do otherwise. But I'm not sure on the rules of, of that matter uh, right there. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I think our final question as we get wrapped up, what's the ideal appearance of the turmeric when you're going to harvest it? Um, I, when I uh, pulled the turmeric out, uh, it's, it's kind of a tough one to do. I, I basically um, waited until, let's see, it would have been the end of October, um, and I, I pretty much had to pull it out because it was just going to get too cold. Um, and so I, I just uh, dug it out of the high tunnel, uh, just because there was an impending cold snap coming on, and there's just uh, I, I didn't hold it out for longer uh, than that. If you're growing in somewhere like a greenhouse or something like that, you could actually probably wait until that the plants go into a natural dormancy, which is something they do after about 10 months of growing. Um, you can harvest the the portions that way. But but really, when it comes to ginger or turmeric, you can um, you know after. I'd say six months. You can pull portions of that plant out to just have available for market, or if you're eating this at home, just to pull a, a chunk of that that root out um, and and use it in some type of a, a dish or something at home. So it's uh, it's variable uh, in terms of, of timing of harvest. Just make sure you give it enough time 
in the middle of the growing season to, uh, to for those root systems, those rhizomes to, to bulk up. All right, sounds good. Well, thank you, Chris. I think we're, we're finished today. I, I just want to take the time to thank our presenter, Chris Enroth, Horticulture Extension Educator, for this very good presentation, sharing his expertise. I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us for this webinar. Hope you get some information that will help you in your small farm endeavors. Hopefully even something you can put in place yet this winter. You're going to look for an email that will come from Zach Grant with a link to today's archived webinar. Um, you'll also find that on the Illinois Local Foods YouTube channel, as well as a very short evaluation of the webinar you've just watched. We do look at your feedback and we really use it to shape our future webinars. With that, I wish you a very good rest of the day and a very good productive growing season in 2018.